Hello everyone, welcome to the Health Course channel. Today we will teach human embryology. The topic that will be exposed in this video will be about phenomena and changes that occur during the second week of gestation in an easy, quick and simple way. The idea with this is to mention the basic concepts of human embryology in a very short and concise video. Before we begin, let's remember that by the end of the first week, the blastocyst had begun to invaginate into the maternal endometrium and erode it. This endometrium is eroded by the syncytiotrophoblast, and this is what allows the blastocyst to get inside it. The outermost layer is formed by the cytotrophoblast, and both the cytotrophoblast and the syncytotrophoblast are part of the trophoblast. Finally, it should be said that between the seventh and eighth day, the embryoblast began to differentiate into hypoblast and epiblast, and this we are going to see now in more detail. On the eighth day of development, the blastocyst appears partially submerged in the maternal endometrium. On the one hand, as we have said, the trophoblast is differentiated into two layers, the cytotrophoblast as the inner layer of mononuclear cells, and the syncytiotrophoblast as the outer multinucleated layer without visible cell boundaries. It should be clarified that the cytotrophoblast in mitosis migrates outward to form the syncytiotrophoblast. On the other hand, the embryoblast differentiates into two layers, a layer or sheet of cuboid cells known as the hypoblast, and a layer or sheet of tall cylindrical cells called the epiblast. Both the hypoblast and epiblast constitute the biliminar germinative disc. A small cavity appears in the epiblast, which increases in size and becomes the amniotic cavity. The epiblast cells adjacent to the cytotrophoblast are called the amnioblast, and together with the rest of the epiblast line the amniotic cavity. By the ninth day of development, the blastocyst is implanted deeper in the maternal endometrium, and as a consequence of its immersion in the surface of the epithelium, an occlusion by a fibrin clot is generated. In the syncytiotrophoblast, spaces called vacuoles appear. And then these vacuoles fuse and form large spaces called trophoblast lacunae. On the inner surface of the cytotrophoblast, a thin membrane known as exocellular or Husser's membrane begins to form. This membrane, together with the hypoblast, generates the lining of the exosolomic cavity, or also called the primitive yolk sac. By days 11 and 12 of development, the blastocyst is fully immersed in the endometrial stroma, and the surface epithelium closes completely, causing only a small adult in the lumen of the uterus. The trophoblastic lacunae of the syncytiotrophoblast form a remarkable intercommunicating network, and at the same time the cells of the syncytium penetrate deeper into the stroma and erode the endothelial lining of the maternal capillaries, causing maternal blood to enter the lacunar system. The capillaries that are congested and dilated are known as maternal sinusoids. Thus, as the trophoblast continues to erode more sinusoids, maternal blood begins to flow through the trophoblast system, establishing uteroplacental circulation. At the same time, a new population of cells appears between the inner surface of the cytotrophoblast and the outer surface of the exocellular cavity, forming a thin, loose connective tissue. This tissue is called extraembryonic mesoderm and eventually occupies the entire space between the trophoblast on the outside and the amnion and the exosolomic membrane on the inside. Soon, in the extraembryonic mesoderm, cavities develop that eventually converge into one and create a new space, known as the extraembryonic cavity or chorionic cavity. Subsequently, this space surrounds the primitive yolk sac and the amniotic cavity, except at the point where the germinal disc connects with the trophoblast by means of the fixation pedicle that we will see later. As a consequence of the appearance of the chorionic cavity, 
The extraembryonic mesoderm splits into two sheets, one sheet covering the cytotrophoblast and amnion, known as the extraembryonic somatic mesoderm, and the other covering the yolk sac, known as the extraembryonic splanchnic mesoderm. The maternal endometrium in these days becomes rich in glycogen and lipids, and also this tissue becomes edematous, and these changes are known as decidual reaction. By day 13, the scar in the superficial epithelium has disappeared. However, hemorrhage occasionally occurs at the implantation site as a result of increased blood flow to the lacunar spaces. Since this bleeding occurs around day 28 of the menstrual cycle, it can be mistaken for normal menstrual bleeding and in some cases can cause us to miscalculate the probable date of delivery. By day 13, the scar in the superficial epithelium has disappeared. However, occasionally bleeding occurs at the implantation side as a result of increased blood flow into the lacunar spaces. Since this bleeding occurs around day 28 of the menstrual cycle, it can be mistaken for normal menstrual bleeding and in some cases can cause us to miscalculate the probable date of delivery. The cytotrophoblast cells show local proliferation and penetrate the syncytiotrophoblast to organize cell columns encircled without a site. These cell columns, with their syncytial sheath, are known as primary villi. Additional cells are produced in the hypoblast that migrate along the interior of the exocellular membrane. These cells proliferate and give rise to a new cavity within the exosolomic cavity, and this new space is known as the secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac. This yolk sac is much smaller than the primitive yolk sac, and during its formation, Large portions are shed into the chorionic cavity which are called exosolomic cysts. The extraembryonic mesoderm lining the interior of the cytotrophoblast is renamed the chorionic plate. The chorionic plate plus the syncytiotrophoblast plus the cytotrophoblast is known as the chorion, and the chorion forms the wall of the chorionic sac where the definitive yolk sac and amniotic cavity are suspended by the attachment pedicle. This attachment pedicle with the development of the blood vessels becomes the umbilical cord. Finally, if we zoom in on this part of the biliminar germinative disc, we observe the parts that compose it. The epiblast and the hypoblast. In the epiblast we will see the amniablasts and in the hypoblast, some cells have become cylindrical and make the area thickened. This area is known as the precordal plate, and the precordal plate at this site tells us the location of the mouth and is also an organizing element of the head of the embryo. So, these are the phenomena that summarize all the events of the second week of development. I hope it has helped you. If you have any questions or concerns leave them in the comments. Greetings and success in your exams.